All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, today what we're going to be talking about is what is known as the Scramble for Africa. Um, and this is really the height of our imperialist era. Um, the years that we're talking about here, um, they're going to be about 1880 to 1914. Um, so if you need to put um, out to the side of the title of your notes, Scramble for Africa, um, your years are 1880 to 1914. Um, and... This is one of the more significant events that's going to happen in this time period, in my opinion. Um, and as we'll see at the end of the, this um, PowerPoint lecture, what I really like about this time period is that uh, you see long-lasting effects. The evidence of the scramble um, of its impact still exists today. Um, I'm going to put a link up on our playlist. Um, for a short excerpt and it details how this um, phenomenon from a few years ago, the Coney 2012, if you guys remember the search for Joseph Coney um, that Invisible Children led, um, that's a direct result from what happens during this time period. Um, so make sure you guys have your notes and you're following along as we go through this. Um, you are going to be asked to do more analysis, add on to your notes just a little bit here. Um, so some of it is going to be quotes, some of it's going to be pictures, and then I'm actually going to ask you guys to add on to it here in the beginning. So um, here you have an image that kind of highlights the scramble for Africa. Um, this is an image from a South African diamond mine. Um, it's kind of hard to see because the image has been blown up so much. But if you notice here in the corner, you have an imperialist, you have a European that is abusing um, a South African uh, worker. You see, you can see here in the edges that it is the Africans that are doing the work, that are mining these diamonds for the Europeans. Um, the Africans, by no means, are going to be keeping any of these diamonds for themselves. Um, so, before we get into the scramble for Africa, I want to talk about um, what imperialism is and what are some of the motivations, what's driving the imperialism. So. Imperialism, this is just building an empire by dominating other countries. Um, just to kind of review, we talked with the Transoceanic Empires. It's basically exerting political, economic, or cultural dom and or cultural dominance over another region. Um, so imperialism, this is when you build an empire by dominating other countries. And we're going to have five empire reasons for imperialism. And I'd really like for you to write these down. Um, you can write them on your own piece of paper or you can write them down on the margin in your notes. Um, but I want you to write what the motive is and just a summary of what it means. Because it's going to help explain, give some context as to why Europeans are doing this in the first place. Okay, so our first motivation, the E and M. An empire stands for economic and markets for goods. Um, we talked before about how one of the big effects from the industrialization is that it leads to imperialism um, for a couple of different reasons. First of all, you have an excess of finished goods in your industrialized markets, um, so they're looking for places to sell their new products. Um, they've also, in a lot of cases, exhausted their raw materials, so your imperialist powers are looking to gain raw materials from other places. Um, so with this economic slash markets for goods, Europeans are looking for somewhere to pawn off their goods um, as well as a place to gather raw materials. Um, we talked about how this operated in India. They grabbed all the raw cotton that they could from India and the British sold back finished cloths. So your first motivation, the E&M and, and Empire stands for economic and markets for goods. Then we have the political power motivation. Um, with this one, basically, the more colonies you have, the more territory that you show you that you can control, the stronger you are. And this one's heavily influenced by nationalism. Uh, there's a lot of competition here. Every country wants to be the best, and they're competing for colonies. Because, like I said, the more colonies you have, the stronger you are perceived to be. 
You also have an ideological motivation. Um, this basically is goes with social Darwinism. So with the ideological, make sure you note that this goes along with social Darwinism. There's a few things. Um, with the ideological motivation, you want to spread the civilized or European way of life. There's the belief that if you're not European, then you're not civilized, and it is the Europeans' duty to spread their knowledge and culture and ways of life. Um, it's heavily influenced by the idea that the white race was superior. The other races were not civilized like the white man was. Um, and with this idea of social Darwinism, <clears throat> basically it's saying <clears throat> the strong nations will survive. It is the duty of the stronger nations to overpower the weaker ones. This wouldn't have happened to you if you were stronger, that kind of idea. So um, you have economics, markets as one motivation, um, political power, which I would parentheses nationalism there, ideological motivation, which is um, racial superiority and social Darwinism. The R in empire stands for religious. It's this desire to spread Christianity around the world that Europeans have had for hundreds of years. And they believe that once they take the message of Christianity to the so-called heathen people, that they would convert and the heathens would become civilized, basically they would become like the Europeans. And the last motivation is the exploratory motivation. Um, so the last motivation in your empire acronym is exploratory. And the basis of this one is a few different things. Um, one, they just want to go on adventures. They want to go see new areas of the world. Um, this kind of makes me think of, like, if you talk to college students. I just want to see the world. I just want to see what's out there. I just want to go, you know, that's kind of how Europeans are to some extent. Um, they're also going out to conduct scientific research. They're studying biology. As um, Charles Darwin goes out on the HMS Beagle and comes up with this theory of evolution during this time period when he explores the Galapagos Islands. Um, and Europeans, they want to just, they want to go on adventures, go to different places. Um, you see this a lot of times with, like, second sons, um, kind of make a name for themselves, go on adventures, because they're not going to inherit the title and the land. So, um, your five motivations for imperialism, you have economics, markets for goods, you have political power, ideological motivation, religious motivation, and exploratory. Make sure you guys do get those down. I'm sorry if I went a little fast. Just pause as needed. Okay, so as we talk about the scramble for Africa, we're going to be focusing on the change over time here. And to get us thinking about this, we're going to look at two different pictures. And feel free to pause the video as you need to to answer these questions on your notes. The first thing is what is the date of each picture? which it's going to be given to us, what's the date. We're ask, also wanting to know um, who is shown to be the powerful one in each picture, and how do we know this. And finally, what major change is depicted as taking place over time? Okay, so our first picture is a drawing from modern-day Uganda. Um, what we see, so we have a monarch of Africa here, who appears to be um, leafing through a Bible given to him by his guests, who are British explorers. So you have the names there, James Augustus Grant and John Henning Speak. Um, this uh, picture comes to us from 1862, so it's the earlier end of our era of imperialism. And your description here is that it says European travelers, explorers, and missionaries were often the forerunners of colonization. European governments sometimes justified colonial conquests and occupation by citing the need to protect their citizens who were living or traveling in an African or Asian land. What conclusions might be drawn about the power relationships between the people shown? So if you look at their status, you have the king on the raised platform. Um, reading the body language of the ones uh, sitting either on the ground or in the chairs. What you're looking for is um, who is shown to be the more powerful, um, who's shown to be given the greater respect. 
And we're going to compare this picture, this drawing from Uganda, with our second image that comes to us from West Africa. Um, I apologize, the description has been cut off, but we'll work through it. Okay, um, so in this picture you have King Prempe, who is um, a ruler of a large West African um, Ashanti state, is kneeling here, as is his mother. Um, they are kneeling to the British military, British officers. Um, so I hope what's obvious to you is the position of importance of the people um, on the raised platform. Um, obviously, with this picture, if the king is sub bowing to them, he is displaying his submission. Um, this ritual is similar to what the um, Ming and Qing dynasties demanded, which was the kowtow ritual, um, which is basically, it's a really kind of degrading display of inferiority. The kowtow, you kneel and kiss the ground nine times, it's not, it's, it's just a really degrading position to be in. Um, so make sure that you guys get your questions answered comparing these two and that we see the change over time. If you can't see, um, this picture is from later in our time period. It's from 1896. So with this time period, we are smack dab in the middle of our scramble for Africa. Okay, so the scramble for Africa is this hurried land grab by Europeans for African lands. Um, the height of this comes at the Berlin Conference in 1884 to 1885. What's been happening is that you have Europeans that are staking claims on Africans land and the competition heats up to the point where they pretty much are say, you know, we okay we have to settle this, we have to do this a more diplomatic measure. So, they invite about 14 European nations to Germany um, to discuss what to do with Africa. You have Great Britain, France, Portugal, Spain, um, the Belgians, the Germans, Italians, all meeting to discuss, okay, how should we divide Africa? What are we going to do? And their method of um, settling this was basically if a country laid claim to it and proved that they could protect their territory, they were given that colony. Um, what's important to note here is that no African leaders were invited to this con uh, con conference. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, when that happens, that means you get no input from the African leaders about cultural differences, linguistic differences, um, and none of that is present. So there's nobody to say, oh hey, these two tribes really hate each other, so to put them in the same boundary is going to be problematic. Or there's no one to say, okay, well all these people in this region of Africa, they all speak the Bantu language. So it would be really easy if you um, put them all together in one region. Basically, Africa was carved up with no attention paid whatsoever to the cultures, the language, any of that of the actual of the African people. So if we look at Africa before the scramble for Africa pre-1880, um, only about 10% of Africa was under foreign control. This was from our trading post-colonialism. Um, most of the only part of Africa the Europeans are hanging out in is the new coastal regions, whether it's the West African um, areas with the slave trade, um, South Africa, the Swahili city-states, and North Africa, um, trading in the Mediterranean trade network. Um, Europeans are not going into the interior of Africa. However, 34 years later, Every single part of Africa, except for Liberia and Ethiopia, are under European control. And to an extent, Liberia is not exactly free. 
It is the state that the United States set up at the end of the Civil War to return um, freed slaves that wanted to go back to Africa. That's the name Liberia, Liberty, uh, capitals Monrovia for James Monroe. It was set up as um, basically freed slaves that wished to return to Africa. The United States would take them to Liberia. So um, within 34 years, Basically, the entire continent is carved up by Europeans. Here is Africa before the scramble. And you can see um, yeah, the Ottomans that are up here in Egypt, uh, Tripoli, Tunis, modern-day Tunisia that are controlling North Africa and Egypt. Um, the French are in Algeria, Senegal, parts of the west coast of Africa, um, and the British again west coast southern Africa uh, the Dutch are down here in the Orange Free State in the South African Republic and you have the Portuguese and that's really it um, keep this map in mind as we move forward because you'll see how Africa changes by the end of this time period okay so if we think about how we go from colonialism to imperialism um, we have a few things that are going to change. Um, we have consistent contact between Europe and Africa after about 1400. And by that we mean like Central, Western, Northern Europe. Um, Spain had extensive contact with Africa through the Moors. Italy has extensive um, contact with Africa. But if we talk France, Germany, Great Britain, those areas, um, we have consistent contact after 1400. Um, Europeans, when they start their quest for luxury goods during the late Middle Ages, um, they're exploring into Africa and gaining um, some textiles, ivory, animal skins, gold from North and West Africa. Um, all sparked by Prince Henry, the navigator, and Portugal's entrance into the slave trade. Um, in the beginning, Europeans perceive Africans as exotic. They're different. They have a completely different culture. It's very foreign to Europeans, but in no way do they see them as inferior. Instead, they see them as equals. Um, that changes, though, in the late 1500s as the slave trade ramps up, um, as Europeans shift their focus to plantation colonies in the Atlantic world. With the slave trade, the increased demand for slavery, Europeans um, begin to see Africans as inferior and this racism develops between the two. Okay, so Oops, sorry. Go back. Um, that's kind of our colonialism. We're not really moving into full-fledged empire yet. However, the late 1800s, um, with steam-powered technology, like um, steam-powered ships, the railroad, um, internal combustion engines, um, mass-produced weapons, and the rise of nationalism, it leads to competition between European nations for um, colonies. Uh, so, with the Industrial Revolution, Europeans are able to penetrate Africa in the way they had not been before. Um, steamships allow them to sail upriver in Africa. Um, railroads allow them to go further into the interior. Um, and things like quinine and vaccinations help with malaria and yellow fever. So Europeans are now able to explore areas of Africa that they'd been limited before. Um, so with this competition, we have a race for Africa's raw materials and these new consumer markets. Um, the British are mining salt, gold, and diamonds in West Africa and South Africa. They're competing with the Dutch in South Africa for um, gold and diamonds. Um, 
it's like 1864, 65, somewhere around there, um, gold and diamonds are discovered in South Africa, and it seals that region's fate for the next 150 years. Um, the Belgians are operating in the Congo. Um, they're tapping rubber from the rubber trees in the Congo and setting that back up to work in their factories. Um, and the Belgians are going to bring nothing but trouble to the Congo. Uh, they were very, very harsh rulers led by King Leopold. Um, they're known for, like, if you weren't producing enough rubber, they would, like, cut your hands off, defigure um, workers, defigure children. Um, they were just really bad news bears all the way around. Um, and what you guys will see in the video before, if you have not, heard a lot about the Rwandan genocides of the, um, 1994. Um, it's a direct result of Belgian rule in the region and the way that they um, um, exploited differences in the cultures. So, um, anyways, all these different countries are competing for access to the raw materials in Africa, and they're also looking at these regions as markets for their goods. Um, by this time, slave trade and legal slavery has ended, so um, the best way to um, exploit these regions for the raw materials and whatnot is to establish colonies. Okay, so as a result of the Berlin Conference by 1914, um, Europeans colonized all of Africa except for Liberia and Ethiopia. And we mentioned before that Liberia, it's a U.S. Um, not, they didn't run it, but they set it up as a freed slave state. Um, and Ethiopia has a really cool story about how they um, resist independent or resist imperialism, which we'll look at in just a minute. Um, during this time period is when you have the saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Um, and it's promoted by this guy named Cecil Rhodes. Um, Cecil Rhodes was a very colorful figure in British history. He um, is a huge proponent of imperialism. Um, and this is a political cartoon from the time period. Um, and the caption on it, which is not on here, but um, the British slogan for imperialism especially in Africa, was that Britain wanted to gain a north-to-south continuous line. Um, their slogan for conquering Africa was from Cape Town, which is in South Africa, to Cairo, which is in Egypt. So this kind of shows Cecil Rhodes um, exhibiting the British goals and their accomplishment. It's that, you know, their goal is to run from Cape Town to Cairo. I should have did that backwards, but anyways, you guys get it. Um, by the sun never sets, um, I want you to just make a note that the British goal was to gain a north-south line across Africa. Okay, so we have two primary sources from the time period, um, from, um, citizens in Africa, they were uh, subjects of imperialism, and I want you to answer on your notes what contrasting or similar views on imperialism do you see from Africans affected by the scramble for Africa. Um, so with this, I want you to put a little bit of thought and analysis into it, um, not just, well, he thought it was good and the other guy didn't like it. I mean, go a little bit deeper than that. You don't have to write a page on each, but just, you know, analyze it, dig a little bit deeper. What do they have in common? What do they differ on? And um, just be specific with it. And you guys can pause it here to answer your questions. You're looking for um, similarities and differences in these sources. Okay, so we're going to look at examples of colonial resistance, um, and Strayer has a quote, a pretty sad quote, actually, from um, 
a Vietnamese emperor towards the end of their resistance from French rule. Um, the French and the Dutch are going to control most, most of Southeast Asia. Um, the Dutch take Indonesia um, and the French take what becomes French Indochina, which is now modern day Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam. And the quote says, um, do you really wish to confront such a power? It would be like mounting an elephant's head or caressing a tiger's tail. Um, so he's saying that, you know, fighting them, there's no way that this ends well. You know, if you grab a tiger by the tail, you know, it's not going to be a happy ending for you. Then he says, with what you presently have, do you really expect to dissolve the enemy's rifles into air? So this emperor, he sees really just the hopelessness of resisting Europeans. And almost every area that they encounter, Europeans have far superior weapons, um, thanks to mass production from the Industrial Revolution. They have more weapons. You know, they have steam-powered ships with cannons on them. They have um, handheld rifles with quicker loading. So... Um, in a lot of places, they did see that resistance was futile and that, you know, it was inevitable that they were going to be taken over. Um, there are some areas, though, where they did fight back. Um, outside of Africa, you have the Tanzimat reforms and the Ottoman Empire, where the young Turks tried to reform Ottoman society. Muhammad Ali modernizes Egypt to resist um, imperial influence from the Dutch or French sorry, and the British, um, he reforms their economy, some of their legal codes. Um, the Taiping and the Boxer Rebellions in China are um, movements toward modernization and against foreign influence. And the Me uh, Meiji Restoration, Restoration in Japan as well, um, all focus on kind of modernizing, real, modernizing to resist uh, European control. However, in Egypt, we have military engagement, and what I think is really cool comes from Ethiopia. And um, King Menelik II from Ethiopia plays on these European rivalries. He knows that they are all competing for his land, so what he does is he plays the Russians and the French and the Brit uh, British and the Italians against one another. All the while, he is building a modern army. So while he's exploiting their rivalries, he's buying weapons from each one. And the Italians come in and attack at the Battle of Ottawa. And the Italians come in expecting primitive weapons, primitive fighting styles, and instead they face a modern army. Um, this is a huge victory for Ethiopians. They will obviously celebrate it for years to come and it is a humiliating defeat for the Italians. Um, it is a defeat that they will not get over. Um, they're actually, when it comes time for World War I and the Italians um, go to the dark side, just kidding, um, they are going to try to go back and capture Ethiopia in the World Wars because they have not gotten over losing to them. So, um, beside Ethiopia with this military engagement, I want you to write um, another instance as well. It comes to us from South Africa. Um, Luanda is um, another instance of military resistance. And in this one, the British lose to the Zulu. So what you also need to write outside is to that is that the British lose to the Zulus. Z -U LU in South Africa. Um, that one is more instance of losing a battle instead of the war, which is what the Italians did. They lost it all. Okay. Whoops. So we have a few different forms of rule here. Um, I want you to put a star by direct rule, indirect rule, and extraterritoriality. Um, all of these things will come up again. Um, so, to compare direct and indirect rule, direct rule is used a lot by France. Um, its goal is to assimilate 
um, to make the foreign countries more like the Europeans. Um, with this style of rule, you're only going to use European administrators, so no government offices are going to locals. They intentionally weakened um, native political institutions. There's um, no local self-government. They kind of outlaw the previous customs. Um, sometimes they would do this by using boundaries that cut across ethnic lines. So you divide them and they wouldn't be able to um, keep their culture alive. Um, so direct rule, their goal is assimilation. Um, it's really the Europeans pretty much forcing their culture on these areas. Um, indirect rule is used by Britain and their colonies. They use it in India. They use it in um, um, Nigeria. And with this one, they're going to use indigenous political institutions, um, customary law, and local elites to help rule. Um, so they're going to be blending cultures. Um, the goal here is not assimilation, but kind of like accommodation to help them be ready to rule. And when it comes to um, when it comes to independence after decolonization, the colonies that use indirect rule are going to be much more successful um, at governing themselves than indirect. And it makes sense because with Indirect rule, they have experience with government. You lose, you use locals to help rule. Obviously, they're not going to have the top positions, but they're going to have the lower and the mid-level positions, whereas with direct rule, there's no experience with government. So, um, in all of these areas, though, um, Europeans were not subject to the laws of the colony. Um, this is what's called extraterritoriality, which means that um, th when they are in a foreign country, they are living under the home nation's laws, and they are going to be tried in the home nation's courts. Um, so, like, for example, if someone commits a crime of theft in um, Nigeria, we'll just use that for example again, um, they're not going to be tried in Nigerian court. They're going to be extradited and tried at home in Britain, which means that more often than not, um, they will not be punished for the crime. Um, if you think about, if you, I mean, you guys see this in movies and stuff too. If you hear like, you can't do that to me. I'm an American when they're in a foreign land. It's that idea. Um, and very much foreigners felt that they were above the law. Um, they have the sense of entitlement that the locals resent, understandably so. Um, with this imperialism, um, Strayer talks a lot about how this race and segregation plays out um, in areas with a lot of white settlers. Um, for example, in South Africa, um, it creates a system of apartheid which is their name for segregation, where the whites and the blacks are completely separate. And they kind of do that to um, establish the superiority um, of the Europeans in South Africa. Um, imperialism has huge religious implications in Africa. This leads to the Christianization of Africa. Um, he talks about like half of sub-Saharan non-Muslims are converted to Christianity um, as a result of European imperialism. And in all of our colonies, we have economics in play here. Um, who's doing the work? Is it wage versus forced labor? Are you paying the workers? Or is it kind of like the Belgians in the Congo where it's basically um, slave labor? So um, by the end of this time period... Here is what Africa looks like now. The British go north-south, Egypt, Sudan, um, Uganda, down into South Africa. Um, the Germans have Cameroon, um, Algeria, that, that's not Algeria, I don't think. But um, the Portuguese are going to be in West Africa and over here. The French are going to go through West Africa. Um, Morocco, 
and over to the coast. The Spanish are much smaller settlements. Um, this is going to be the Belgians in the Congo, and Ethiopia is our lone independent state here. Oh yeah, Italy has parts of Somalia um, and North Africa. So by the by the time it's all said and done, um, all of Africa has been carved up by Europeans. So what I want you to think about and uh, answer these questions is um, when it comes to the scramble, who is the real loser here? Um, and with this idea of nationalism, how will imperialist powers operate the economies of their colonies? How are they going to operate the economies of their colonies? Um, how does this dash for territory lead us to the outbreak of World War I? And how are companies that made goods for consumption linked with this scramble for Africa? Um, I'm going to link a video to the playlist. Um, it's a 10 minute, less than 10 minute video about the scramble for Africa and it connects modern day problems in Africa to this time period. Um, and this is what I really like about this time period is that you do see, um, I think for one of the first times in this class, you see immediate, like real our world effects of what we're talking about in history. So, um, as always, bring your notes and stuff with you, bring your, your questions with you next time that we meet. And we will talk more then.